It's that time of the week again. It's the Shoal Weekly Podcast where we're talking about all things film, TV and pop culture. I'm Joe. Joining me as always is Charlie. Hello. We've got Connor. Hello. And Ben. Hi, how's it going? If you're joining us for the first time or if you're joining us from our social media platforms, thanks for following and supporting us. We really appreciate it. If you're joining us from our link tree, do make sure you go and check out our social media pages if you want to stay in the loop. And if you're following along on our socials this week, you'll know that today we're going to be talking about something different. It's a documentary film from Iran, 2011's This Is Not A Film. But before we get into that, how have you guys been? Busy, man. Busy week. Yeah. Have you had any time to watch any films? Uh, Not as many as I have previously, but I have Mm -hmm. watched. I followed the trend from last week. I watched uh, Almost Famous, which obviously I loved. Five star rating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought another music sort of themed film. I went High Fidelity. If anyone's ever seen that, oh, okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's got Jack Black in it. So, where can you watch it? Uh, somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're such an advocate for sort of um, more independent streaming services like Mubi, and yeah, every time I ask you where you've watched a film, you're like, uh. <laughs> uh, somewhere um, yeah. Connor what have you been watching this week I've been watching a weird mix of things so I watched some classics I watched When Harry Met Sally on Valentine's Day no less and I, I rewatched E.T. and I didn't realise how long it really takes to get to the main meat of the story in E.T. if you rewatch it there's like so much of these guys just like wandering around in the woods at the start it like takes so long to get into it uh, and I watched uh, have any of you seen Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile? I haven't. It was the it was the film about Ted Bundy, which had Zac Efron playing him, and everyone was like, "This is really odd." And the trailer was like way too upbeat for the film, and it, it definitely wasn't like a perfect film, but it was pretty good. And like Zac Efron did a good job of playing such an awful person, and like um, got a lot of like the mannerisms and stuff right. So. I think it's a good film to watch for the acting, I think, mainly. I always thought seeing the trailer, even though I hadn't seen the film, that uh, Zach Efron would be good at playing Ted Bundy because, weirdly, it's so strange to say this about a serial killer, but he had quite a following of, of women who thought he yeah. was very attractive and very charming. Yeah. And to put someone like Zach Efron in, in that role, uh, I do think it kind of suited it. It's like um, Charlie Manson, wasn't it? Because he had quite a few female followers that adored him as well. It's weird how sort of cult like yeah. atmosphere of it that they just love the guy. <laughs> Let's maybe not talk, go down that road today. <laughs> it's, no, it was like that um, the Netflix series You, wasn't it? You know, the, the stalker. Um, and everyone was just like raving about the guy. It was I can't remember the actor's name, but he's the one from uh, Gossip Girl. And then he was like mm. on Twitter, like, why do you like my character? He's an evil psychopath who kills women. Like, don't like this guy and everyone's yeah. like oh my god love him <laughs> speaking of uh weird cults uh no doubt ben has been catching up on discovery of witches this week yeah i watched season two finale <laughs> got that out of the way that was amazing and uh yeah i, I immediately googled when season three is coming out uh and found out they just finished filming this week so probably have to wait till probably like the fall for that to come out um but uh yeah i actually did watch something else this week i watched uh in time another 2011 film uh, with justin timberlake and uh amanda uh, seyfried which uh i actually have not watched for a while and uh i really enjoyed it it's it's quite a fun film and justin timberlake isn't everyone's favorite person at the moment i know that that's all uh, i know yeah. about justin timberlake at the moment oh no what's happening I'm not too familiar about the story, but um, I know he had to apologize to Britney Spears and oh, right, okay. someone else. I'm not too sure. It was all show business. Right, okay. Yeah, that whole Britney Spears saga is pretty messed up. What about you, Joe? What have you been watching? Uh, I watched Parasite this week, actually. Um, nice. I know it's something that we're probably going to visit in the future, but uh, my, my housemates hadn't seen it, and I took the opportunity to watch it. It's the second time I've seen it, and uh, it just gets better every time, really. The way the cinematography tells the story as opposed to the script, it's it's quite a 
it's quite a masterpiece in storytelling really um and yeah it's it's great for the korean film industry you know, it's the first non-english speaking film to win best picture at the academy awards so it's definitely one to watch but yeah no it's also been a quiet week for me as well i'm uh, currently in the process of uh moving house so not a lot of time to sit around watching films but i did actually find time uh, to watch this is not a film this week and i really enjoyed it so i'm really looking forward to talking about that however it's been quite a busy week for for film news as well i know we've seen uh the mortal combat trailer did we all get a chance to watch that yeah i uh i like the look of that actually i have to say uh i'm quite a fan of the games though so mm-hmm. um but i like how they're just going sort of all out action with it like there's some ridiculous even just in the trailer you can tell there's going to be some ridiculous sequences in it like mm-hmm. straight from the fatalities in the game and i think that's probably that's probably the way you've got to go with a film like that you can't you can't make it too gritty and real because it just won't come across seriously do you know what i mean so i think it looks good i think it's come out of the right time if you look at the success of like the fast and furious franchise and john wick you know yeah. these hyper real kind of action films that they're, they're becoming very popular now so i think you know when, a few weeks ago when we looked at dread if more combat had come out at around the same time as as dread i think it would have suffered the same kind of fate but yeah yeah i think more combat is going to be it's going to be um a good popcorn flick i think for sure is there a uh, is there a release date for you because i didn't i didn't see that um it's it's quite soon actually um quite a late oh, right, trailer yeah. release yeah it should be april time start of right. april uh on hbo max and eventually i guess other international streaming services because we don't have hbo max here in the uk it will be going to cinemas as well wherever cinemas are open but i'm not getting my hopes up here for that so yeah. probably catch it on some kind of uh vpn who knows we might have a conversation about it on here sometime yeah yeah that'd be good um speaking of hbo max zach snyder says he's working on another project for them he's going to be developing a king arthur film i think he's found quite a nice home working for hbo max because they since the acquisition of uh, warner brothers like the whole warner media group by at&t they put a lot of focus into hbo max because obviously streaming is the future sadly for cinema but it is uh, and I think with with them giving him a lot of confidence in releasing his version of Justice League, I think he's excited to develop something about King Arthur. But I'm not too sure how accurate it's going to be, but I know he always makes a really good looking film. So I feel like it would be sort of like 300 style. Yeah, there's been a lot of King Arthur films. I really don't know if we need another one, I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, actually quite, I quite liked the last um, King Arthur film. It was the Guy Ritchie one. Was it Guy Ritchie? Yeah, I think it was Guy Ritchie. So it was... There's action everywhere, and it was mm-hmm. uh, like some epic music underneath. I quite liked it. It was, it was a bit. It wasn't. It wasn't trying to be as realist because there, you know, there was like hundred foot elephants in it, which <laughs> was like a bit of a jarring opening scene. But you know what? Once you got into it, it was, uh, it was kind of an entertaining film. The uh, the best King Arthur film is The Holy Grail by Monty Python. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very accurate. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah, those coconuts, the way that they, yeah, yeah, that's the most accurate <laughs> portrayal of horses I've ever seen in my life. Oscar for best sound designer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what else has been happening this week? Have we caught anything on the Twitter sphere? Sia done fucked up. Did she? What has she done? She released a film about autistic people that wasn't very nice. Yeah, this has been uh, there's been a lot of it about this for a while. I've been following this a bit. It's the one where the main character isn't autistic. It's just an actor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was also compounded by the way she replied to autistic people criticizing it as well. Instead of kind of listening to any criticism or trying to have any kind of meaningful conversation, um, she pretty much just said uh, something about, you're not an actor. You'd be a shit actor. What are you talking? Something like that. And it was just like, what the hell is Yeah. That was uncalled for. I saw that. I, I, in one, on one side of it, I can kind of understand the reason why it was cast as you know a normal person playing a part because obviously to make a film is you got to learn the script, the lines. There's the whole production side of that, and I think she did say that they tried originally um, to cast an autistic person as like a like for like part, but um, but yeah, you, the way she, the tone of the 
communication from her end has kind of missed the mark quite I think, significantly. I think she absolutely could have cast it as an artistic person. But also, if yeah. she had, the portrayal of an artistic person in it wouldn't have been so horrendous, I think. So, like, it was just bad. It was like... It's, it's just a weird area of film that no one really knows the, the correct answer to solving it. And it's just an awkward area, isn't it? The answer might be more disabled people in filmmaking. I know this is a huge topic not to get into on this uh, episode, but that's I think that's probably got to be one of the solutions. Or at least listening yeah. to disabled people when they say things about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I was going to say, have you seen the, the rating of it on Letterboxd? Because I've never seen a rating like it. Like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it is ridiculous. Like the, the figure of the most popular vote is like half a star, one star. And it, then it just like tails off towards like five stars. Like no one's given it a five star. It's insane. I've never what seen a review. The, what was the film called? Uh, is it called Music? Yeah, it's something like that. It's nice to know there's some kind of democratic power still to be had where people can just say, this film's horrendous, so let's all just say what we think about it. Yeah. I, do you know, it, it makes me want to see it though, because I want to see if it is actually that Yeah. Bad. Okay, that's one to not. That's one to find anywhere other than legit places. I'm, I'm sure yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Okay, that's don't right. pay for that. So... Don't give the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a chat about this. Is not a film, shall we? Yes. Yeah. What did we all think about it, Charlie? You brought the film to us. I think you you obviously um, really like it. So I, I want to get your impression first. Okay, so I first heard about this film through my undergrad. Um, it's a weird one because I, could, I don't know if I saw it for a documentary course or not, but because it isn't real. I, to me, it isn't a, a real documentary. It doesn't exude documentary style to me. Do, do you see what I mean? Well, why, why don't you give us some background to the film? Um, just for our, if our listeners haven't caught the film this week and they'll understand what it is. Right. OK. Yeah. Uh, so the director, Panahi, in December 2010, was placed under house arrest for six years um, for his alleged crimes against national security uh, in, like, in the Iranian government uh, and his like, pro-democracy activism. Uh, he was also like, banned for 20 years from creating films and forbidden for giving interviews. And then This Is Not A Film essentially shows him under house arrest and like, the struggles to create and how to deal with loneliness, essentially. It's, it's interesting to see the way he gets around not creating a film, I think. Because he, he does all he is getting interviewed essentially by the, the director. Yeah. Well there's two directors to the film as well, which is really <laughs> confusing. But by his friend. He's essentially getting interviewed, but he isn't because he's like reading scripts. It's such a strange film. So I guess the first question really to ask is is is, is it actually a film, even though the title suggests that, that it's not? Or is it a documentary? And I'm interested to know what you guys think about that. It's, it's kind of kind of a bit of both, isn't it? Because, I mean, this is the problem is like it's it's almost a documentary about making a film, but then it's crosses over into to film about making a documentary because he's technically not allowed to make a film. Otherwise, he'd get yeah. thrown in prison. It's like you could kind of just keep going round in circles looking at it from a different viewpoint. I think. I think it's generally categorized as a film. So I think we just, the easiest answer is just to accept that it is a film. I think it's not a particularly good film because, again, he's under house arrest and shooting off an iPhone 3. Um, I just think if you view it as a documentary about filmmaking, it makes it a little bit more interesting because obviously all the background information that Charlie's just talked about kind of gives it, well, it kind of makes it cool and interest, like actually interesting. Because the film, I didn't really think was really that much. Yeah, it's a strange, it's a strange watch because it's like, it, Charlie, you were saying before, you were like, "Is did I enjoy it? Is enjoy the right word? It was interesting, but like, yeah, yeah, was it an enjoyable experience? But then, like, it wasn't obviously it wasn't made to be an enjoyable experience. It wasn't made to entertain. But yeah, it's kind of like, would you call it a film? I don't know. Is it is it just a recording? Is it like just a sequence of recordings? Because there's not. There's minimal editing in it as well, isn't there? Obviously, it's just put into a sequence, really. I think there's a bit in the film where uh, not Panahi, his his friend, is like, "I'm just going to leave the camera here to record it uh, as yeah. like a document," and he's like, yeah. "You need to document things." And I think that's essentially what the film is. It's just yeah. him documenting what's happening. 
Central. That line really resonated with me when when he said uh, it's it is important that the cameras are on. Yes, yeah, yeah it was really right. poignant, yeah, yeah. and and I'm not sh I'm still not sure now what exactly was meant by that and, and why, but I think I think if if this film was going to have like a tagline on the poster, yeah, you know, yeah. it would be that it, it you know it is important that the cameras are on. It was um, it almost had like a sinister undercurrent, didn't it? That sort of you know to see mm -hmm. the police can come. And, and get you so the cameras and that's what it came across to me i know it could have yeah. a lot of different meanings but there was just something there was these two friends joking and he's he's uh propping the camera up with a lighter and then he asked for his box of cigarettes he's like you're using a lighter as a tripod and then he's like yeah you need to keep the camera on and it just the tone just changes it's, it's really yeah from from that point on for me it's it all becomes a bit more paranoid as if yeah. something yeah. else is as you say something more sinister is happening yeah well, right up until the very end, when you know uh, the young man who was taking out the trash, he he was able to go around and carry on to take out the trash, but but Jafar wasn't allowed to leave yeah. uh, the building, and, and you just look outside and just see that fire through through these through this fence, and it almost looks like a prison cell. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it, the last twenty minutes, it's strange. I feel like there are a lot of moments in the film that are quite circular, so. Uh, the first half of the film, Jafar is kind of, he's pondering all these philosophical arguments about film and the nature of making art. Yeah. And then without knowing it, he almost executes those points like wonderfully uh, in, in the second half of the film. Um, one example I really like is when he's talking about how the amateur actor leads you to yeah. allow you to tell a film uh, the actor does the directing for you for so that you are able to explain it later on. And the same is true for location and stuff like that. And every time you think that the film then has direction, it subverts and, and, and changes. So if you consider the final 20 minutes of the film, you know, the director's following this young man who is taking out the trash. So on some, to me, on, on some meta level, this really reflects back to Jafar talking about how actors allow the director to explain after the film has been shot and you know Jafar chooses to follow this young man to hear the story of his life and his studies and um the story about how one time the police raided his sister's uh, apartment um and he it's, it's almost like he seemingly chose to abandon his own beliefs regarding film but in actuality he, he executes the very things that he was philosophizing over earlier on when he was talking to his colleague you know uh, and that young man became the subject of that 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 philosophy as well. In in the it, he says he's like, oh, you're turning me into the actor, like in, mm. in part when he's yeah. in the left. And yeah. then uh, Jafar's like, no, no, don't say that. Like you can't say that because then I'd be directing yeah. you, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's actually quite interesting because one of his previous films, which again is quite difficult to call a film, um, he it's about this girl who. Um, I can't. I don't know the name of it. I just kind of came across it and was was just like reading up on it. Um, I've not watched it, but I've seen some clips of it. Basically, this girl, um, this young girl, like maybe six, seven, eight. Um, she's like comes out of school and her arm is in like a cast, and basically it's about her getting home. Like like her mom doesn't pick her up, so the film is about her getting home. And anyway, so she she follows this man and then gets onto a bus that takes her in the right direction. And basically, as they're filming it on the bus she just breaks character and the cameras are all rolling everything's you know going on she just whips off the cast throws it down takes up a bit of her costume throws it down tells the bus driver to stop and and she's like i'm not acting anymore i'm not doing this anymore and she gets off and she just walks off but she's still mic'd up so they're just like what do we do you know this the, the main actor has just walked off um so they just decide to follow her around and basically it goes from this film where it's scripted to almost like this like it flips from if this film was actually real maybe that's what like what would happen so it's her uh, like mic'd up like just like they're like hiding around corners like yeah. filming her and stuff and it's it's a very it's a very similar principle you know when you said like the actor is is basically directing where the film's going to go and what the film's going to be um and it's just really weird um but it's it's interesting how a film that he was allowed to make kind of similar like the similarity with the film he ended up making when he was under house arrest oh sorry not the film he made because he didn't make a film under house arrest because he wasn't allowed to <laughs> yeah we didn't watch a film this week did we guys no, no we there, there is no film of the week this, no 
the sequence of recordings. This is not a podcast. <laughs> I'll, 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 say, yeah. I'll say as well, um, I think there was a lot of thought went into the, maybe not as much thought as the other films that we've made, into the aesthetics of the film, because there were some shots that were really interesting. Like, there's, there's one of, he's just stood on his balcony and he's watching these cranes work like outside his apartment and it lingers on that for a bit and it just like i don't know it really struck it was really interesting just purely visually but then it was also like he's literally just watching the world go by in this huge bustling city while he's in the house arrest and it was like you know that that was included as yeah it's just documented in his day he stood on the balcony for five minutes but there was obviously some thought went into the subtext of some of the shots and things i think that really elevates it as well yeah, I think that goes back to the whole circular idea of the film because, you know, in in effect, Jafar becomes the amateur actor and then yeah, leads the yeah. film. And that's not against the law for him. He, he didn't say anything. Um, or did it say anything about that? He couldn't act or... No, I don't think it did. Because he yeah, said he could uh, read a script. He could read yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah, so there's just, the, there are these wonderful parallels and wonderful kind of like ironies throughout the whole uh, piece. Um, one thing I actually noticed, uh, it's probably coming from my, my theater studies, is uh, the whole production really seems um, quite Brechtian. If you're not familiar, though, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there, yeah. there's, a, there's a German theater director, Bertolt Brecht, he was a drama practitioner. And um, basically, I noticed that there are a lot of parallels between Jafar and Bertolt Brecht because they were both enemies of the state. Uh, during during their respective times and to me it, it seemed throughout the whole documentary that Jafar was trying to keep an artistic focus throughout this weirdly experimental shooting day and if you noticed when he becomes emotional about the very philosophy of film he doesn't let his emotion be seen on camera he, he's very composed he walks away and if you're familiar with Brecht that is very Brexian because he was rather against this sort of naturalistic cathartic theater of like the Victorian times and he believed that if while the audience believed in the action on stage and they were becoming emotionally involved they lost the ability to think or to judge objectively about a situation right. or about something moral uh, and this was called the um I think it's I got it here uh which is like this alienating effect oh. um uh, so this was the act of distancing the audience from any emotional involvement. And to me, I think Jafar does that completely because he could have chose to make this documentary about either A, his struggles in appealing his jail sentence, or B, about the struggles against the radical government of Iran after the 2009 election and his rights as an artist and all of his colleagues. But he doesn't. All of those bigger issues take a massive backseat and so without all of that emotional drama playing out in the documentary, we as the spectators are shown such a naked truth about filmmaking and art. And I just, I loved that um, in that sort of, we got to see it through that kind of lens. Yeah, I think it was a much, it would, it would, a much more affecting on like affect on the film mm -hmm. than if it was simply a uh, documentary like a lot of other ones about the government, you know, a lot of facts thrown at you and figures and, a bit about his life it, it it still would have been interesting don't get me wrong obviously but yeah i think the way that they went about it it was, it was a lot more a lot more affecting mm -hmm. even the tape on the carpet was was so brechtian it was so you know uh, this is going to be a piece of film but i'm not building a set and i'm not actually running the cameras i'm just telling you where the shots are going to be um yeah and yeah it was it was fantastic there was one little moment in the film which kind of I don't know, it kind of, um, it was almost like I was getting CPR and someone just shocked me back into life because I was so kind of uh, lost in this weirdly experimental world that he had created in the first half of the film. And then all of a sudden he switches the TV on and there's the news report about the yeah. tsunami in Japan. And I was like, all of a sudden yeah. like, whoa, actually this is real. This, this, is, this, is actually, this was actually happening for this guy in 2011. Um, so I really liked that as well. Not the tsunami. Yeah. I'll tell you as well, <laughs> as well, as well, what helped it come across as, as human as it did was there's some, there's some good humor in the film as well. There's uh, one bit that really made me laugh more than it should have was him trying to feed his, a relative of his that left an iguana the, uh, in the apartment. Yeah, yeah. He was trying to feed this iguana and it wasn't eating it. He was telling it off for being stubborn. And 
They were just like these tiny little human moments. He's a, and I looked at the credits, and then the cast is just the, the lizard is part of the cast. <laughs> no, it's not, is it? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. No, but going back to that, uh, the Brecht thing. Um, I suppose in in film terms, it's like active and passive viewing, isn't it? It's like are you active in the viewing, or are you just there to witness it, sort yeah. of thing? And yeah, it's interesting where you stand on that and what type of film mm. makes you feel as if you're actively viewing it or just witnessing it, I suppose. I think that's a really important topic at the moment as well. We, at the moment in our day-to-day lives, especially during the pandemic, we, we witness more than we partake in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think this was a really pivotal film to revisit during the pandemic because, you know, we are like, like Pahani, we're so isolated and all we can do right now is to witness the world through a lens and we're cur- like constantly questioning how far we can we can take that um and so you know in some ways to me it's not a documentary i feel like it's like a, a video essay without commentary yeah um, you know it's this it's 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 you know bristling with like real world urgency but pointed like it, it but pointed as like a surrealist project and it's really provocative and radical, but also really human. And like you said, it's got that humor in there and it's playful. And uh, it's, it's so many things in one. I can't put a pin in it as to what it actually is. The Brechtian style makes it feel like it can't be real. But mm-hmm. then as you just all of a sudden you get hit by like, oh, well, it is real. Yeah. yeah. Because it mm-hmm. is, it's, it's just a document of, of life, but adapted to be art, I think. Mm-hmm. And then you could, you know, you could go on and talk about this forever and say that, well, the poignancy of, oh, can you leave the cameras on? Yes, it had some kind of sinister undertones, but also, why shouldn't we just leave our cameras on and capture everything that happens right. in our day to day lives? You know, why our, our lives can equally just be as artistic and we can put them on show. The whole world is looking at the world down. A camera lens at the moment or a tv or a computer screen because we can't go outside uh, apart from new zealand but you know uh <laughs> so why why shouldn't we create some art whilst we're locked inside and i think it's a really it's a very um it's a very important thing to watch uh, this film i mean at the moment i think as well um to have that creative drive that he does while being so isolated like mm. that's something i found hard during lockdown uh, is to have the drive to even do it because yeah. there's, there's parts where you just want to be like well what's the point like yeah i literally. think i think he does that as well in the film sometimes when he's just there like with the lizard just being like just browsing <laughs> the internet and being like what's mm-hmm. the point like yeah it's like the first the, fir- the first sort of couple of weeks you're like oh crap it's gonna be so much free time i'm gonna get i'm gonna write all those things i've been meaning to write and be yeah. how does that ever happen it does not well, to be fair, we oh, started this podcast, but that's true. Like, um, <laughs> other than that, I've not really done a that's, lot. That's probably because we would have just chatted. if you if we just chatted, we'd have chatted about film anyway, wouldn't we? So it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think that's the parallel, then, isn't it? Really, it's the he was also just sitting around, and he would have been talking or doing something with film anyway. So why not call his colleague to come round and record? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. It's a case of um, why do it? Well, because you can and you should. Especially in such a political climate like Iran. Yeah. You know, where art is very heavily oppressed. Um, and it made me feel very sympathetic. But again, it wasn't wholly concerned with all of those political discourses. It was, as we've mentioned many times now in the past 20 minutes, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very human um almost a, like a, a very human palette like you know it's a it's a canvas of of humanity really it really got me thinking about uh accessibility to creating and viewing cinema like how mm-hmm. in that sort of regime yeah c- can it be seen as a human right to create and consume art i think it should be but especially especially when the art because the art is just having your voice isn't it having you say and yeah everyone everyone should be everyone should at the very least be able to just criticize things you know 
but under that regime, like yeah. you have to find alternative ways to do that. And if it's yeah. smuggling it out in a birthday cake, then you've got to do it. Yeah, I think it was uh, on a like a larger kind of political scale across the Middle East at that time. Because um, remember, this is two thousand and eleven. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia only like allowed movie theaters in twenty eighteen, and I think before that, at the time, there was like one cinema. I mean, I think it was an IMAX, bizarrely, but there was like one <laughs> cinema at the yeah. time. I think it's 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 quite interesting. It's just like film and this is like a whole there's a whole like movement behind this that's kind of maybe a bit of a bit of a side topic about just how like art is depicted in, in Muslim countries because there's quite a lot of religious religious ties to, to art and its depictions and, and yeah. what's allowed and what's like frowned upon. Um, and obviously, this is this is it's not about realism because I think re- if if your art is realistic, that's throughout like that's not allowed. Or it was it, there was obviously I think it's more a case of you know it's what's maybe a little bit more accepted than not accepted stuff. Um, so like I think because he was making very realistic, not not only was the fact that he was kind of criticizing the Iranian government and trying to promote democracy, I think themes of his films as well behind like kind of being very realistic was quite contentious at the time which is just it's just i think that for me that was quite interesting to read upon the kind of actually larger perspective you know why don't we see many films at the middle east well because they basically don't make any um except for egypt um which is quite interesting there is some cool films out of egypt actually um but yeah i thought it was that for me that was quite an interesting you know once i watched it and read up on it i was like oh and it got me thinking and just explored that so it's quite an yeah. interesting topic yeah there was an amazing bit in 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 the documentary i keep wanting to call it a film documentary i don't know <laughs> in the thing in in the thing that we're not doing a podcast about um <laughs> there was an amazing moment where uh, the news announced that the government were all of a sudden banning um they were all of a sudden banning fireworks saying that they were anti-religious uh, and then he just gets out of his iPhone and goes to the window and records the fireworks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When he shouldn't be making films, and when the rest of the uh, population of um, of Iran shouldn't be using <laughs> fireworks, he gets out his phone and records them, which I, I was just amazing. It was fantastic. I love the bit when he's filming his friend filming him. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so, like that's such cinemaception. Love it. And his but friends then, like we're just gonna sit here and record each other for for the rest of the night. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, if you want. <laughs> I want to see a film about him and his colleagues doing that kitchen van. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though. Like, when when are you a filmmaker? If if I was just to to, to record us now, like, is is where's the line? Where's the, the yeah. division of being a filmmaker and just recording something for private consumption? Mm-hmm. I suppose you could take that argument as well into like social media today. You know, TikToks are sixty second films, aren't they? Like, you know, kinda of, at what point you know, the some of them are just jokes, but some of them are actually like people making clips and editing and stuff. It's quite interesting. It's just generally filmmaking. I because I think that's what the film talks about a little bit more, is filmmaking. Well, obviously I think we can all come to a conclusion that this is not a film is something completely different it's it's a masterpiece in a form that really doesn't exist yet uh, and it's been great to talk about it it's been great to talk about a film that is very provoking and makes you walk away and think about what film actually is because at the end of the day we come on this show and we we talk about quite obvious things um and it's nice to actually sit and philosophize which is really why charlie you started this this podcast in the first place is because you were yeah. looking for the you were looking to broaden the conversation about film and this film, this documentary, whatever it is, it definitely does that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But hey, just before we go, uh, we do have some news. Uh, this will be Connor's final podcast with us uh, on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, he is leaving uh, for a little bit to focus on cre- other creative projects, and we just want to say that we wish you all the best with these. And Excellent. we will yeah. be. Yeah, we will be seeing you again at some point um, for some special yeah, podcast. Yeah, I'd love to come back on. Um, but thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for starting this with us as well. Do you want to tell us what the 
project is, Connor, in a short, short little description. It's, it's a, it's going to be a five-part miniseries, a mockumentary based around Manchester, and every episode has like a different theme, like uh, football, the history of Manchester, things like that. So. It's got to be called Francis Dinner's Mancunian Way because the main character is called Francis Dinner. So, if that says anything about it, then go go have a look at it if you'd like. But yeah, we'll definitely share it on the socials. So stay tuned for that. We'll we'll share Connor's project. And uh, yeah, again, just thanks from the bottom of our hearts for joining us for these past few podcasts, and we wish you all the best. And I'll be back. I'll be back in some way. Well, we wish you all the best, Connor, and we look forward to having you back on the show. Uh, but in your place next week, we do have a special guest joining us. Charlie, do you want to tell us about him? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Ethan, who does the uh, Cineflack podcast. He's going to be joining us and uh, just discussing Breakfast at Tiffany's and how he got to be prominent within the podcasting game. Yeah, so definitely stay tuned for that. Follow us on our socials. Hit the notification bell. Subscribe to anything and everything you can because we really appreciate the support. And stay tuned for next week. Thanks all.